Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Azlina Bulma, Director of International at the RIBA, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the first topic of the 2021 Global Architecture Exchanges Series, Climate Change Sustainability. How do architects respond to the climate emergency? After the success of last year's series, we decided to renew the initiative and work again in partnership with the American Institute of Architects, the Australian Institute of Architects, the Architectural Society of China, the Royal Institute of Dutch Architects, Director of International at the RIBA, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all yeah, to the so. first topic of the 2021 Global Architecture Exchanges Series, Climate Change Sustainability. How do architects respond to the climate emergency? And just to reiterate, this, this this is following on from last year where we worked together with the American Institute of Architects, the Australian Institute of Architects, the Architecture Society of China, the Royal Institute of Dutch Architects, Council of Architecture and Urbanism in Brazil, the Japan Institute of Architects, the Korean Institute of Architects, the New Zealand Institute of Architects and the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland. With this in mind, I'm delighted to be the host of this collaboration with our sister institutes, where we have the pleasure to have a great lineup of international speakers from five different countries in Europe, North and South America. It is fantastic that once again, we have an audience from so many different countries from across the globe. For the last 16 months, we have learned of new ways of to connect with each other. And in a way, it is great to be able to reach to so many of you wherever you are in the world. Speaking of adaptation, in this first topic, we will be exploring the practical steps and measures architects need to consider when designing the climate action in mind, looking at how the challenges are tackled across the globe. Today, we have an excellent lineup of speakers from Europe, North and South America. They are experts in this field. We have received, many have received awards for their projects. They will talk about their experience and the challenges they face in their part of the world when designing with climate change in mind. May I take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers whom I will introduce individually as we go through the main presentations. Julie Hiromoto from HKS Architects USA, Marco Cerreto, Professor at the Technology School of Universidad Federal de Amazonas, Brazil, Sarah Odaya, Chair of the R. IAI Sustainability Task Force Island, Amy Holt, PLP Architecture UK, and Menno Rubens, CPZ Projects Netherlands. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule for this event. It is much appreciated. Before we move to the sharing session, there are a couple of housekeeping points for our audience. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. If you wish to ask your questions, and I hope you do, please type these into the question box. We will get to as many questions as possible. However, if yours was not answered, a record of it will be kept and you will be contacted with an answer wherever possible. For any queries, please do not hesitate to contact the team, RIBA International at riba.org. I'm now delighted to open the sharing session. Each of our speakers has around six minutes to share their thoughts. Our, speak, our first speaker is Julie Hiromoto, Director of Integration at HKS Architects USA. Julie Hiromoto is a principal at HKS and the firm-wide director of integration. Her experience managing a diverse portfolio ranging from large and complex projects to boutique installations transforms the built environment by synergizing research, systems thinking and inclusive best practices. She balances business, design excellence and technical expertise while instilling her passion for socially and environmentally responsible design. A recognized national leader in the sustainable design community, Julie drives positive change through various organizations. Her work launching the Center for Architecture, Science and Ecology, CASE, chairing the AIA Large Firm Roundtable Sustainability Group, contributing as a Well Community Working Group member, volunteering as a Living Building Leader and as a 2020 AIA COTE advisory group chair collectively leverages the impact of designers, builders, owners and operators for high performance design and equity. 
Julie is also a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Very impressive indeed, Julie. Thank you. And so I'm going to hand over to you now uh, to Julie. Great. Thank you, Zelina, for that great introduction. Can everybody hear me OK? Yep, yes, that's great. Wonderful. We had a bit of uh, technical difficulties this morning, but I think we've got it all sorted now. Um, so thank you, Reba, for hosting this Global Architecture Exchange event. I am really excited to learn from all of you in Ireland, Brazil, the UK and the Netherlands. And I'm representing the American Institute of Architects, AIA, and uh, it's my pleasure to join you today from Dallas, Texas. Uh, evolve or perish. Uh, next slide, please. We are in the midst of the six mass extinctions that our planet has seen. As the world's super predator, humanity has colonized Earth. The Harvard ecologist E.O. Wilson predicted that if our current rate of ecosystem disruption continues, half of our planet's life forms will be extinct by 2100. Yet we continue to pillage our natural systems. For 30 years, the Union of Concerned Scientists have been sounding the alarm with their warning to humanity. We must act now. Mother Earth may recover, as she already has five times before, but human society, as we know it, may not. Today, I'd like to address four points. Our environmental and social responsibility as stewards of the public's health, safety, and welfare. This includes energy efficiency and fuel source, embodied carbon and existing building renovation and retrofit, and equitable climate action, climate justice for our marginalized and underserved populations opportunities that research and evidence-based design thinking can bring, uh, and our role to distill, translate, and apply this knowledge in our work designing and building our social fabric. The necessity of integrated systems thinking, holistic decision-making, looking beyond immediate and myopic short-term solutions, and most importantly, relationships. We must have an inclusive understanding that values a diversity of perspectives, be humble and authentic collaborators who share generously, but also challenge the status quo, and at least in many Western societies that value entrepreneurial individualism, a mindset shift from a me first to a we first. Do not underestimate your potential for influence. Advocacy is a critical component of being a citizen architect. Sign up to speak at city council and local business community meetings, influence local policy and ordinances, champion land use, transit and parking reform, as well as building performance codes. Last year, I had the honor of representing AIA with congressional testimony. I'd like to highlight two of the points made, which combine design, policy, market opportunity creation, and incentivizing innovation. So energy efficiency must start first with the foundation of good, smart design before leaping towards high-tech solutions. So first, we have to reduce the demand we can learn so much from passive design strategies of vernacular and indigenous architecture and significant energy and resources already exist on site that can be absorbed by moving energy around and transferring heat. Conservation is driven by our behavior and informed decision making. How we inhabit our spaces should be considered first before we finally offset that nominal remaining demand through renewable energy generation. We also have to consider where our energy is coming from. How is it produced, distributed, and stored? So fuel source, and what we're thinking here is whether the larger systemic impacts and societal benefits of redundancy and interconnected systems limit the limit pollute and how we can limit pollution, global warming, and extreme weather uh, from fossil fuel combustion. And are we also thinking about and pitching those long shot ideas to explore demonstration projects that meet multiple needs? When we heard our UC San Diego uh, clients concerns about food waste, we suggested an anaerobic digester that would produce clean energy and pedagogical learning opportunities as a yes and option to consider. And they fell in love with the idea. It can be really overwhelming. There is so much to learn to solve for with the ever increasing complex and comprehensive design solutions that we are asked to provide. How can we incorporate and apply all of this knowledge? We don't need to reinvent the wheel or start from zero or be the expert on all things. We do need the right partners, collaborators and coalitions. At PSAC 2, a 911 emergency call center in New York City, I was a part of a team that leveraged NASA science 
developed for closed loop ecologies of space stations to address a high stress 24 seven work environment while piloting a redundant active ventilation system that could isolate the building's HVAC systems during a security lockdown. So you might be asking, how can the whole be greater than the sum of the parts? We've invested in non-traditional expertise by prioritizing and valuing the influence of different perspectives, methodologies, or experience, which can inform the typical design services that we provide. My role as Director of Integration is to bridge the silos that, and connect research, strategy, and design thinking in our work so that we may lead with knowledge, advise our clients for influence, and realize outcomes that benefit the communities we serve. Like a dense city, this crucible effect results in new thinking, and you can create this type of influence anywhere, not just within your organization, by seeking out different voices, especially the ones that are not already at the table. Ask yourself, who is missing and what will you learn? It is often challenging to bring so many different voices together, and we may get stuck in our work if we cannot bridge the gap um, between our divergent thinking and distributed priorities. A transition, I don't think the slides are advancing anymore. Um, a transition from an inclusive to an inclusive mindset, uh, a depolitization of issues that affects all of us, and moving beyond binary contrasts or monolithic character characterizations towards a multivariant or dynamic solution is really where we want to go. Uh, next, please. At a basic and fundamental level, our relationships are about trust. Here are three strategies for teams to build trust with communities. In St. Petersburg, Florida, we started our process with community meetings. We had an opportunity to transform an 86 acre surface asphalt parking lot, vacant except for Major League Baseball game days into an economic development catalyst to enhance neighborhoods quality and transit and to amplify small businesses by creating a destination focused on a flourishing community of health and well-being. Our design team and city officials joined IWBI's pre-pilot working group for well communities, helping to shape this global standard from a public and municipal stakeholder perspective because of the support of the deputy mayor, Dr. Kanika Tomlinson. So I'll leave you with this final thought. Our essence of potential as architects is to explore and discover empathetically and authentically, and to collaborate, collaboratively build solutions that work for all. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you today. Thank you, that's really, really good. A really good start. Uh, and I'm gonna quickly now go to Brazil, uh, where we will now be hearing from Professor Marco Serreto, Professor at the Technology School of Universidad Federal de Amazonas, Manaus, Brazil. And forgive me if my pronunciation is incorrect, Marcos. Marco Serreto is an architect, researcher and professor at the Technology School of Universidad Federal de Amazonas, UFAM, in Manaus and got his doctor degree at uh, PROPAR, Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Sol, with the works of Mario Maria Porto, Rethinking a Modern Architecture in the Amazon. Marco's work focuses on Brazilian modern architecture in Amazon and its national and transnational connections with different cultures in contributing to the construction of a resilient Amazon in the 21st century. He's a current member of the Superior Council at Instituto dos Arquitetos do Brasil, IAB, founder and leader of Nucleo Arquitetura Moderna na Amazonia, NAMA 2016. NAMA is a collective group gathering of artists, architects and research group from different universities from the Brazil, Brazilian Amazon. NAMA aims at the preservation and, in, and divulgation of Amazonian architectural modernities. Uh, Marcos is also a curator of exhibitions, including contemporary architecture in the Amazon, Zama, um, from 2018 to 2019, and resilient Amazon architecture at Sol Benale of Architecture and Urbanism in 2021. Over to you, Marcos. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Riba, for the invitation. Uh, I will start now. Climate change demands behavioral society change in order to reduce global warming. 
We have lived through hard times in Brazil with environmental standoff, which compromised the 2030 Paris Agreement. Facing an unfavorable political condition, how do architects in Brazil respond to the climate emergency? The Brazilian modern architecture represents a milestone of Brazilian architecture in contrast to the disruption of academic tradition and international style. Brazilian modern architecture recognizes the tradition, the Brazilian plural culture, and the site as essential tools to develop a project. Between the sun and the rain of our tropical summer, it is essential the correct implantation and building protection, Brise Soleil, is exalted at the Ministry of Education and Health Building in Rio de Janeiro. Architects Lucy Costa, Oscar Niemeyer, Lina Bobardi, and Vila Nova Tigas established a heroic generation of the Brazilian modern architecture. We have recently lost Paulo Mendes da Rocha, the second Brazilian architect to be granted with the 2017 Riba Golden Medal. Niemeyer was the first one in 1988. Marcelo Ferraz and Francisco Fanucci are partners at Brazil Arquitetura Office. Ferraz worked with Lina Bobardi and they present the living permanent tradition of the Brazilian modern architecture project on their works. Either Cobogó at Sertão Harbor in Recife town or wooden, breezes, or wooden Breezes at Social Environmental Institute building in São Gabriel da Cachoeira County town. The building protection is a cultural resistance which generates circular economy and also protects building by reducing power consumption. Angelo Bucci highlights the house implantation as a major aspect at different sites. While the bucolic environment along São Paulo State coastline preserves the cliffs and the soil with a passive construction, the urban environment at São Paulo town keeps the principles of a free soil and revegetation by providing with the urban environmental qualification. Cristina Xavier performed the Taguaí Village project in Carapicuíba town in the outskirts of Sao Paulo. The use of a series of renewable clean tech principles is boosted by the construction of certified wood leftovers which, trans which are transformed into supporting panels for the house. Such, such house were envisaged along with engineer Elio Olga. At the Environmental Tech Training Center in the countryside of Amazonia, Cristina repeats, repeats the partnerships with ITA Construction and enable a local training on wood ground, contact protection, as well as the traditional knowledge, such as the use of straw and biodegradable natural products to provide soil waterproof waterproofing. The project is a process. Roberto Moita performs the integration between the natural environment and the constructed one with an architecture that connects the nature with the industry district by mixing biodegradable elements with industrialized ones. Such conditions is started by Severiano Porto in the 60s, also known as the Amazon architect. The macro coverage is an architectural shelter which protects from the sun and the rain. At Passerine Ranch House and Trusted House, such fundamentals are remarked 
and consolidate a paradigm of Brazilian architecture, all started by Lucio Costa. José Porto Carreiros Sebrae Sustainability Center rescues the Chabonos cover skets by Xingu local tribes by utilizing a macro coverage with armed steel roof slats. Such solution with a double selling hide. Sorry, such solution with a double ceiling height feature at the indigenous constructions assure a temperature reduction of about 10 degrees Celsius. It was granted with 2018 Green Prize as the best building in the Americas. Lohatrus also adopts the macro coverage and the correct implantation as a passive construction instrument regarding the environment with a low land occupancy and high vegetation permanency. Campina Arena House and Taruma House feature various technologies that assure low power consumption and contribute to CO2 reduction as well. The Children's Village recently awarded by RIBA in 2018 blends the connection of these architectures with a living modern tradition, either with indigenous straw or armed concrete, concrete shelter at Sao Paulo University Architecture School by Artigas, the facade protection soil maintenance by using contemporary technology are tools of disciplinary culture. Historically, exalted solutions are used by a new generation of Brazilian architects who are concerned about the site, culture, and environment with our main weapon, the drawing. The project shall resist. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. And I do remember reading the transcript for the Gustavo Ubrabo building uh, that won RIB International Prize and all the project looks amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, we're now going to go to Ireland um, and I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker, Sarah O'Dwyer. Sarah is currently the chair of the RIAI Sustainability Task Force and is a member of the ARP engagement panel. She splits her work life between practice and academia, teaching and researching in sustainable design theory and practice. Her, in her own practice, uh, work at HK, sorry, KH Architects and the interdisciplinary practice Place Plus U. She has worked on public housing, town master planning, cluster housing guidelines and age-friendly mm -hmm. neighborhood schemes. Sarah's practice work involves engaging in multi-strand public engagement processes to embed projects in the context. She is currently working with TU Dublin on an Erasmus Plus funded project, Arc for Change, with four partner European universities, exploring ways to co-create an architectural climate emergency curriculum. Her current PhD research also explores methods for integrating sustainable design theory into architectural education. Sarah, over to you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Um, very glad to be here, everybody. Um, so if you're gonna have the first slide, please. There might be a bit of delay uh, in my connection, I think. So they, um, what I'm here, I suppose I've got many hats there, a lot of us do, but the one I'm here presenting on is with the, as chair of the Sustainability Task Force in the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland and the recent publication of our Sustainable Pathways uh, guidance publication for member for our own members, but for the wider design team and for general um, information as well. Uh, next slide, please. This comes off the back of, I suppose, an updated and invigorated sustainability policy, which we launched in 2019 and actually we collaborated with the Australian Institute of Architects back then because um, we basically used uh, the, their original work in this area and kind of adapted it for an Irish context. 
Um, so the the pathways documents yeah follows that and it will be also followed later in the year by the 2030 climate challenge document, which is going to go into more detail on the actual metrics and what we're going to use to measure our impact and our success in this area. So I suppose what, where this comes from is a, a series of support documentation for our members to actually get at the implementation part. Um, next slide. So what we have found is that we have the theory, we have the information, we have the policy, um, but the really important part then is to how to translate that into implementation on the ground. Um, so what we wanted to do with this document was to create something that is concise and compact. Um, so it's not an exhaustive um, document that's going to cover every single issue to do with sustainability or climate emergency themes, but it will be um, accessible, I suppose. We wanted to kind of overcome the fact that there's so much information out there, it can be actually overwhelming and um, difficult for members to know where exactly to start, so that we could provide something that would bridge the gap, that would give the, I suppose, a summary, a precise and concise sum summary of what you need to do and at what stage mm -hmm. of the design you need to do it and when you need to do it. Um, so this design guidance is intended to, to fill that gap. Next slide, please. Um, the, the also the part of it um, is is to do with providing the, the actual metrics. As I mentioned, these will be dealt with in more detail in the 2030 document. But what we wanted to do again very briefly is to just actually define what the important metrics and issues are how they're measured and why it's important to be looking at them. Because again, I think there's an assumption that as architects, we everybody knows this stuff and that's not always the case. Um, so it's trying to provide a baseline knowledge for people that's accessible, concise, and it's all in, in one place. Um, the, the actual themes then are split into six. There's context, design choices, design performance objectives, procurement, construction um, and handover, and then post-occupancy evaluation. And we felt it was important to include PoE here as well, because that's a bit that kind of gets left off. We're also um, eager to move to the next project that we don't always learn the lessons that we need to in the one we're going through at that time. Um, each each part then, each of those roughly aligns to, I suppose, the design process, if you think of the design process only in a linear fashion. I know it's not always like that, um, but it, the, the, as well, that was to make it for a familiar um, concept in terms of practitioners. You know, it's, it's, the, it's a familiar way that a project would be working through the work stages. So, and each theme then has the associated metrics that are most relevant at that stage and some very, um, so it's high level summary guidance about what you should be doing and uh, what you should be looking at at that stage and the types of things you need to be incorporating in, into your design. Um, as I said, it was really important. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, to know not just what you need to implement, but when and how you need to implement it. So again, we have, um, if you just go to the next slide, sorry. If we have, um, again, aligned and summarised that on a, on, a, on a kind of one page spreadsheet. So I, always in mind was our, with the idea was that this should be really accessible and easy to use, that it's not another document that's kind of overwhelming or another piece of regulation, that it should be really um, hands on and accessible. So we've summarised, again, all of the different work stages um, here and all of the different metrics and all of the different parts that you, you issues that you need to be looking at and thinking about at, at different stages of a project. Um, the, the, another aspect to this guidance document is um, a paper tool, um, an auditing tool to come out of this. Um, although we see this actually, it's, you can, it's available as in a paper format and an Excel format. Although we see this as being a tool that we use in many different ways. It could be a, you know, a skills audit for yourself to see actually, do I know about these particular topics? It goes into more detail on each of the six themes in terms of asking yourself questions. Um, it's purposely not an environmental assessment method like Briam or LEED. It's it's more to lead the design rather to evaluate a final design. And we see that it could be um, also used to kind of, uh, at inter especially in interdisciplinary design team meetings, to kind of kickstart the conversation about what the design is supposed to achieve. And when you say sustainability or climate emergency design, what you're actually talking about practically within the design. The last piece then is this summary of 10 steps, um, because again, with with releasing documentation or guidance or publications, I think it can be 
it's important for someone to come away and know exactly what it is they have to do from there. So we have 10 very simple practical steps that any architect or any construction professional could implement in their practice from today um, to enact actual real change. Um, very simple things build it, that can be built up because with this support document, I suppose we're trying to target people who aren't currently doing these things and we want to enable that kind of huge cultural shift, that huge um, industry mind shift that, that's required to get to where we need to get by 2030 and also beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That's fantastic. I know uh, you've had some technical problems, but I think that ran very smoothly. Thank you very much for that. Um, we are now going to move on to the United Kingdom. I'd like to welcome Amy Holtz, Head of Sustainability at PLP Architecture. Amy is a lead accredited professional and a passionate advocate for environmentally responsible design across both the building and urban scales. She heads PLP Architecture's sustainable, uh, sustainability design group, which serves as a research think tank and a collaborative body. It works with teams to develop project specific sustainability strategies and helps to implement these across all the stages of a project. She's currently co-managing and leading the design team for 22 Bishopgate, PLP's dynamic new tower in the City of London that creates an interactive vertical community for working and discovering. The project has been designed to achieve a BREAM Excellent rating and was the first project in the city to register for the WELL certification. Amy received her Bachelor of Architecture from Auburn University and Master of Sustainable Environmental Design from the AA and she has an ongoing relationship with AA serving as a guest critique for its MRC and MSc programs in sustainable architectural design. Over to you Amy. Thank you very much. Um, hi, I'm Amy and I'm speaking to you from London. You can go to the next slide. Um, now, I don't claim to have the answers to today's topic. However, I do want to show you a snapshot of three commercial projects that I've led in London and the lessons that we've learned along the way. They may point us to possible solutions. Page Street is a cut and carve retrofit in Westminster. In 1964, the original concrete frame building on the site served as a hospital. In 98, it was refurbished and reclad in a style that quickly became undesirable and left the building empty 10 years later. In 2011, we started the project as an internal refurbishment with Derwent London, but its future as part of what became the Burberry campus required more intensive interventions, including a full reclad and both horizontal and vertical extensions to the massing. Now, we built on the idea of a layered tartan in developing the, the details for the new facade, retaining the existing frame and hung a prefabricated strongback system that was then clad in handset brick and the new facades brought order to the varied floor to floor dimensions of the frame beyond each bay creating a calm and pleasant workspace with the ability to open windows and let the outside in oh i'm moving too fast the next project i want to tell you about is cannon street this is a view taken from the golden gallery of saint paul's cathedral our sensitive neighbor in contrast to page street the existing buildings floor to floor levels were not deemed adequate and they com compromised our ability to add additional floors under the viewing corridors of saint paul's the 70s office building was therefore demolished and a new headquarters office building was inserted into this sensitive context. Unique orientational and environmentally responsive identity. Can you pause for a second? <laughs> and identities were created. Can you stop one second? Yeah. Can you go back one? So it's just saying that we had unique orientation, orientational and environmentally responsive identities around the building. On to the next. Thank you. Sorry. And then, then it can crack on. Um, calm and ordered across from St. Paul's playfully stepping back and plan to provide views between Wren's Abbey and Wren's Cathedral with deep stone profiles set into ordered frames to create a language for the building. We worked with Tom Stewart Smith to create pocket spaces for, at the roof for occupants and at ground floor for the public pocket park. Now, the next project, I'm going to jump up significantly in scale. This is 22 Bishopsgate in the heart of City of London 62 story multi tenanted office building we completed in November. A goal was to create a vertical village inside of the tower, encouraging well being through the provision of 100,000 square feet of amenity space. And this includes an urban market at the base, co working spaces for startups and small businesses, 
a gym, a retreat, a club level, above which there's a public viewing gallery and a restaurant. Um, all of these were key program requirements which diverge from a typical spec office building. The base is the civic face for the building, serving as a crafted and human scale juxtaposition to the glass and steel tower above. The glass and concrete canopies create a cornice line for the building and work to deflect downdrafts from the tower. To further humanize the building, we worked with artists both inside and out. This is Welsh, Welsh glass artist Alexander Beloshenko, who helped us create an art walk around the building, integrating pieces into the facades and canopies and public realm. Internally, we worked with craftsmen, including Pierre Renard, a French furniture maker, and Bill Amberg, a British leather craftsman, to create intimate spaces within the base of the tower. Now, and the lobby is open, <coughs> excuse me, is open to the public and serves as an art gallery with changing exhibitions. Um, the building design and its operation encourage a vehicle free, it can go to the next slide, a vehicle free public realm, including high quality active commuter facilities and the use of a consolidation center outside of London to reduce the number of deliveries and vehicle trips to the building. 22 reuses all of the existing foundations and half of the existing two story basement the combined capacity of the foundations for the previously abandoned Pinnacle Tower and those of the original building on the site help reduce carbon emissions of the foundation by 70%. Now at the heart of the building is our 1.25 million square feet of office, flexible office space, over 62 stories, allowing multiple tenants and flexible internal arrangements. Externally, we wanted the glazing to behave like a chameleon on the skyline. The lightly reflective facade changes throughout the day in response to light levels, viewing angle and the surrounding environment and morphs between being opaque, translucent and fully transparent. The blinds within the facade skin have built in step points depending on required solar shading, adding further visual dynamic and patina. It's a active closed cavity facade system with movable blinds connected to the building management system, dynamically operated based on the environmental conditions and the needs or wants of tenants, and resulting solar protection is up to three times better than a conventional facade, maximizing daylight and allowing lights to be off more of the time. We have three meter floor to ceiling in the office plate, 3.2 at the glass, all providing even better natural light and allowing a blank canvas for the fit out within. So very quickly, that was 22. It was a over, quick overview of three very different projects with very different responses. The big question is what do we do next and how do we achieve it? In terms of environmental, all three of these projects push to reduce carbon in use through good design, but in retrospect, there are always areas for improvement. On Page Street, can you skip to the next slide, please? On Page Street, we designed an operable window in every workspace only to find that the building operators asked all occupants to close them. Next time, we need to do better at ensuring the mixed mode operation works as part of the holistic solution. On Cannon Street, the stone frames allow the building to sit comfortably in its historic context. The stone is bonded to precast concrete that is then supported by the primary structure. All of these materials have inherent structural capacities that may not be working to their full potential. I think we need to find ways of building leaner and being more honest in our material choices and responses. On 22, if the glass module, for example, had shifted from 1.5 to 3 meters across the tower, we would significantly reduce the piece count and embodied carbon of the facade. Also, the building was fit out with cat A ceilings and core finishes on all of the office levels. Going forward, we should look at how we can find ways to not build interiors as speculatively, or again, just be leaner in our requirements and avoid additional layers of material if they're not needed. Sorry, I'm almost done. Now, as I said at the start, I did not promise to have the answers. I think events like this allow us to learn from each other on improving how and what we build. And I hope I gave you some good food for thought because I think I definitely took away myself a lot of food for thought in preparing this talk and looking forward to the future. So. Thank you very much. 
thank you. That is really very intriguing and absolutely we are definitely learning from each other. And I always find that I learned so much from listening to uh, other people from uh, different parts of the world. So thank you for that. Uh, we are now going to hear from our last speaker and we're staying close by and moving to our, uh, the UK's neighbours, the Netherlands. Mano Rubens, uh, project developer and director of CPZ Projects. Menno studied economics at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam and gained his degree as an architect and structural engineer from the Delft University of Technology. Uh, since 98, he has been the architect and project developer and director of CPZ projects, the development expertise of the Dutch architectural office CPZ in Delft. Um, with his studio, he has been working intensively to radically apply the principles of circular design and construction in architecture. Sepazet Projects breaks through the head and run project development of the past decades and strives for more flexible and adaptive building stock, conceptualized according to the building as product methodology in which both sustainability and disassembly play an important role. The building as product introduced a concept of permanent temporality within the built environment. Recent projects developed by them and designed by uh, CBZ architects include the temporary courthouse in Amsterdam, catering pavilion, the greenhouse in Utrecht, and building demountable on the that site that also holds the office of the various CBZ expertise. Over to you, Manu. Thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Menno Rubens. As, uh, as I said, uh, I'm an architect project developer at uh, CPZ. And I want to talk to you about uh, developing future proof architecture. How can we design and build future proof buildings? As said, CPZ is a multidisciplinary company based in, uh, in Delft, the, the Netherlands. Um, Together with uh, 100 colleagues, uh, the, can we have the next slide? Are they not timed? Yeah, okay. Um, with, uh, together with 100 colleagues, we focus on the development, design, construction of uh, both commercial and residential projects. Um, next slide, please. Yes, we believe that uh, architects can add substantially to making a better future for our planet by following the definition of the United Nations of, of, um, of sustainable development. Meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. And what can we do? Uh, we can do that by embracing the impossibility to predict the future. How can we make buildings that are not opposing the inevitable changes that the future will bring? How can we make buildings that don't try to predict the future but can absorb changes and enrich itself getting older. You can do this by recognizing the different layers as defined by Stuart Brandt and designing different layers according to their life cycles. Uh, elements can have more flexibility extrinsically or intrinsically. To lower the use of resources, we have to move towards a circular economy. Avoid parts of your building becoming a recyclable waste. Maintaining the value of your project by placing the focus on higher circular priority levels like refuse, reduce and reuse. I want to show you two recent future proof projects that we developed, designed and built. The first one is the demountable office building in Delft and the second one is a nature inclusive housing project in Almere, both in the Netherlands. This is the demountable um, building as an extension to our own office in Delft. Even though the building is demountable, it is not a temporary building. The building has a hybrid structure of steel and wood and has a transparent glass facade. All of our buildings are designed as kits of parts. This, this enables you to produce the building off-site and assemble it on-site. This method gives you better control over aspects as time, quality and building costs. Uh, in the next slide, you see three phases of the building process. The building consists of four floors that can be divided flexibly. The entire structure was built in only a few weeks. This means minimal nuisance to the surrounding while building the project. The entire building is assembled on site and all connections between the different building elements are dry. There's no welding or pouring concrete on the site. The building is a kit of parts that can be de and remounted multiple times. 
The result is a transparent building that can be used as a single or multi-tenant office building or can be transformed into apartments or laboratories. It is also possible to move the entire building to a different location. The building is designed, produced and assembled like a product. This leads to higher quality, faster building process and building with a higher adaptive potential. This building is ready for an unpredictable future and to be used by many generations. The next project I'd like to show is a modular nature inclusive building system we developed for a series of low density village estates. People who want to live close to nature and in a village like setup are the target group for this project. We started by creating a diverse community of potential inhabitants of the village estates by organizing meetups. The community got to know each other, got to know the housing concept and the first location where, 20, where 82 houses uh, are, uh, uh, are built. We created the concept where the houses and the landscape coexist. By carving the existing landscape and sliding the curved longhouses underneath the landscape, we created a housing project that is also 100% landscape. By covering the houses with the landscape, we combine different qualities in one concept. The homes are oriented to catch the warmth of the spring and fall sun, and the covering also insulates the homes and protects them from the sound and shadows of the surrounding windmills. The project consists of eight longhouses and one community house for the residents to use for work and recreation. The longhouses are divided into six different sizes of homes from small to extra large. This project is also developed as a kit of parts. All building elements are produced off site and assembled on site. This leads to the modular design where neighboring houses can be combined into one house in the future or can be individually changed by floor plans. In the prefabricated wooden structure of the skin and roof, most of the installation is pre-installed. The proportion of the rooms gives the residents a wide angle view on the surrounding landscape. Most of the surrounding landscape is owned by the entire community, but also every house, every home has its own private garden directly adjacent to the glass facade. To keep out the heat of the sun in the summer, we installed a canopy of PV panels on the um, above the glass facade. The access to the homes is located in the landscape covered side of the longhouses. Some specific rooms have windows that are carved out of the sloping landscape. The organization of the longhouses creates maximal privacy for all the residents. This is a recent aerial view of the projects that we hope to finish in the fourth quarter of this year. This modular nature inclusive and flexible village estate is future proof and ready to adapt to the needs of its future residents. Today, I showed you two of the many projects that we develop, design and build with the potential to adapt to the unpredictable future. We think it's our duty as designers to design future proof buildings to facilitate the transition towards a global circular economy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Manu. That's excellent and fantastic, uh, to, you know, fantastic ending to five fabulous speakers. Uh, we're now going to move on to the Q&A and I really want to encourage our attendees to put in questions. Uh, but I'm, I hope the speakers don't mind me indulging myself by asking the first question before we go on. We've received a few, but we're going to start. I'm going to start with uh, about the climate emergency and the role of institutes. With climate emergency and learnings from the global pandemic, you know, the profession really need to adapt quickly to emerging issues. What do you think? What does a panel think Architecture Institute can and must do to ensure this happens? Um, and I'm, I'm just going to start calling people's name if that mind. We'll go by the how we started the, the day um, today. And I'll, I'll go first of all to Julie. Oh, thanks. I think this is a great question. Um, AIA has been working on building our reputation and influence as systems thinkers uh, that can help solve some of the biggest issues of our time. Our federal advocacy team prioritizes opportunities at the national level. That's how I got the opportunity to testify before Congress. Um, we are connecting with mayors and policy makers on a more distributed uh, state and local level and other collaborators beyond the typical architecture, engineering and construction industry to broaden the tent, so to speak. 
Uh, we even went so far as to sponsor or purchase ads at both major political parties' national conventions leading up to the 2020 presidential election, where we recorded a public service announcement or a commercial <laughs> to screen during the events that advocates and highlights the role of architects and our ability to contribute as systems thinkers and thought leaders within and beyond uh, the four walls of a single building. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Marco, any thoughts from Brazil? Okay, thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see okay. you as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess we have an essential role on this debate. Uh, in Brazil, we have lived through a troublesome period and retrocession with Bolsonaro's government regarding increasing deforestation areas, illegal mining, and environmental setbacks. Uh, the Institute of Brazilian Architect has published an annual global guide uh, on good practice. So along with the architect's resistance, we may be able to contribute with the environment and society. Thank you, Marco. That's a really good insight uh, into what's happening in Brazil as well. Um, Sarah, your views from Ireland. Yeah, I suppose your question kind of aligns well with why we, the, or I published that particular sure. pathways guidance at the minute, because this was just trying to recognise a, a weakness or a gap that needs to be filled. Um, I think your question as well, and I maybe this is, I don't know if this is common to, to many of the institutes of this idea about responding quickly, because um, I think sometimes we as professions or as institutes can get bogged down in, in, in policy and things and really we need to flex much quicker and respond much quicker to, to issues. Um, saying that the climate emergency is an issue that's been coming a long time and we're, we're only really responding to it now at the very last second, the very last decade that we can. So I suppose I'd like to encourage um, a little bit more responsive um, to, you know, being a bit more responsive to issues or being able to implement things quicker and support members, support practicing architects in changes, whatever they are that they need to make. Um, and hopefully with our pathways document, we're trying to to do that. But I think more more kind of supports for members to get to where they need to get is, is what, what I would say. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Amy, any thoughts from the UK? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think I think there's been a shift change post pandemic. We've been forced to go remote, but for all its downsides, I think we're connecting with each other a lot more than we were doing before. We're attending more seminars, we're discussing more things, and we're making the time for it in between our busy schedule. And as we return to our offices, I think we need to find it a way. And I think it's these these organizations that need to keep offering and keep pushing because I think education is paramount for the most experienced to the youngest architects and continuing our education because only till recently have we been really focused on embodied carbon. It's always, you know, the operational has really been our push, but we just need to keep learning because I wouldn't even dare to say that I know half of what I need to know in order to address this, the emergency. Um, so yeah, I just think we need to keep offering it and then those of us that go back to our desks, we need to keep attending them rather than sitting back into our comfy chairs and, and gluing ourselves back to our computers and not attending and participating. Yeah, there's much for us to learn, isn't it, from here uh, and much the Institute can do as well to support uh, our fellow members. Thank you, panel, for that. Um, I'm now going to go to one of the questions we've received. Um, the first one is uh, I'm going to I'm going to direct this question to um, Sa to Sarah and Marco. Uh, it really is about what advice would you give for, to students who are at the start of their career? who aren't very senior in their firms about how they, how the students can influence or, you know, starting their career can influence change within their practices. Uh, Marco, do you want to start first? Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think I suppose in my other uh, hat as an educator, I can see that students are so passionate and so engaged in this in climate emergency topic. In fact, I think industry is way behind where they are coming out of their education. Um, I think I would say is don't wait to be asked to do something. Yeah, I mean, put yourself forward as saying, I'm going to look at this particular area or I'm going to be the sustainability champion in, in our office. Um, here's the types of things I think we should be doing. I think it's also worth saying, and it's related to another question about clients, is there so much we can do in this area without necessarily getting approval? I mean, a lot of it is about good design. Uh, natural ventilation, daylight, orientation, massing, the use of materials. It's not necessarily stuff we need need approval from anyone to do. So I think it's, it's yeah, stand, putting yourself forward and saying, I, I'm going to take this on and I'm going to look at this area instead of waiting. And also like enacting good design changes um, that don't actually need anybody's permission for you to do them if they're just good design. Can I plus one that, Sarah? I think that um, that's so important, getting involved in your local community. Uh, I know all of my kind of knowledge and expertise was grown. You know, the foundation was laid in school, but then as you get involved in these organizations and you're hearing all these lectures, as Amy was saying, and absorbing all this knowledge, you take it back to your project teams. And as a junior architect, I was asking those naive questions and challenging my seniors and then really listening to the responses of them saying, well, this is why we don't do that, or here are the maintenance concerns, or here are the client's concerns. Um, and then thinking again, okay, well, how do we respond to that? And just keep pushing, you know? Mm -hmm. I, th I think that that's how you grow. And I, I remember the day when someone turned to me and said, well, what do you think we should do? And I said, why are you asking me? And they said, oh, you're, well, you're the expert. And I thought, oh, how did I all of a sudden attain this expert status? I was the person that was going to these meetings to learn and to ask the, the dumb questions, you know? And, and it's that advocacy, I think, that pushes us all forward. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Marco, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Sarah and Amy. And I think there is a current greater awareness than in our, uh, our formation. Our students is different for our formation. Uh, the architects have an important role to help students think better on environmental solutions. We, we all need to be heard. I mean, students and professionals, uh, because uh, the architects, uh, there are uh, the architects, uh, the institutes are in political situation uh, in distant political situation to uh, change this these conditions uh, in in the world, uh, I think. Uh, but I think the students uh, today uh, are better than us, and uh, maybe uh, do some architectures and cities better for the environmental. Thank you. They certainly have more understanding uh, in recent years, isn't it, as part of the uh, um, knowledge that they're gaining on the climate, which is great to see. Um, I want to take the next question. It's about clients. Um, and I would like to uh, start with um, going to Julie, followed by Amy and then Mano. And then from an RIB itself, we launched the 2030 Climate Challenge, which is really to encourage practices in the UK to pledge support and implement changes to meet the net zero for life carbon. Uh, but really that, you know, from what we hear from our members, that really is quite meaningless without the buy-in from clients. So what do you think we can do to influence clients and bring them on the journey? Let's start with, uh, let's start with Julie, please. Yeah, in um, 2018, I think, uh, AIA revised our code of ethics, which to require all of our members to address and advocate for climate action with our clients. And not all of our members were equipped with the knowledge and the tools and the resources to do this. Uh, so we've been working hard to build that capacity 
um, AIA adopted uh, institute-wide the framework for design excellence, uh, and I can provide a link to that for everybody, or if you just Google AIA framework for design excellence, uh, which was initially developed by COAT, the AIA's Committee on the Environment, as the evaluation criteria uh, for our top 10 design award as uh, the, the, the institute-wide approved definition of good design. Uh, and this framework is a holistic system that helps designers not only think about, but also facilitate clients with our conversation uh, through 10 principles of design excellence uh, that result in beautifully performing projects. You know, there are things that we can do without asking the client's permission. Uh, a lot of them I talked about, you know, in that pyramid of kind of impact. Um, but our, our work will be exponentially easier if our goals are aligned. And so using that framework to kind of talk through that with our clients and say, what's important to you? You know, how does this align with your bottom line, with your um, external messaging, the, the reputation that you have, uh, not only for your talent team, but also out there in the industry that influences your business? And what is your future risk uh, and how are you mitigating that? Thank you, Julie. Uh, Amy, any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, my answer goes back to education, and I think we have to educate ourselves in order to educate our clients. But I also think we're all that we're having to get there because the legislation is changing, and we have to meet it. And we cannot, as I think um, that Sarah made a excellent point, and I 100% agree. Is a lot of this sits in our basket that we don't have to ask them about. We just need to make better decisions on every decision we make. We need to be making sure we're not specifying the same things we've always been specifying. We're not just just following the path that 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 we follow because we know how to do it. We just need to we need to shake ourselves up and 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 start doing it better. But I do think I mean I as on the other side, I think I don't think clients are totally behind. I think the they are moving forward as quickly as we have to move forward because investments have ESG at the heart and and that's how they're getting the money to do development. So we are they are having to do it. And the only way we're all going to get there is if we figure it out together. That's all. That's all I can say. About it. <laughs> Thank you. No, 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 that's not just all, but really good. Uh, Manu, what, what are your thoughts? Have you got thoughts from this? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, for, I think it's never an excuse that your client is not asking for it to not do uh, do it. Uh, I can, um, yeah, you can, you should just show your client, uh, seduce them, um, surprise them with with your uh, your innovations, and not uh, uh, wait for a client to ask for the uh, the innovation. You can also implement certain aspects without uh, having to emphasize it every time. Uh, if you see some kind of sustainable uh, techniques, which uh, are now very common, uh, but they, they took some years to, to become common, um, that will be also uh, be the case with other uh, with other uh, sustainable uh, elements. Um, and I, yeah, it's a bit um, uh, it's a bit a well known uh, quote by. Uh, um, by uh, the Ford, the, the car manufacturer, who said, if you would ask uh, what kind of car would you like, and, uh, and they would said uh, they would have the clients would have said, I would like a faster horse. Uh, and so, you, innovation never comes from asking or uh, asking uh, your client what he wants. It comes from your uh, your intrinsic motivation to innovate and to dare stepping a bit outside of the, the common lines. That's a really good point, Manu. And I'm going to hold you there for the next question, which will also open to the, the rest of the panelists, please. And it's a very pertinent one. Um, one of the audience is saying that thank you for this fascinating journey around from around the world for all the speakers. What do you think is the single most important change for us to make to save the planet? Um, uh, as an architect, you mean uh, probably? Uh, yeah, as an architect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as an architect, we should be um, less focused on 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 wanting to uh, to make some kind of permanent uh, change with our architecture, um, because uh, 
the, it's a bit counterintuitive for for an architect, but uh, but we I think you should think more about what what will happen to your building once it's not uh, uh, in use anymore. Once the demands are different, once uh, the pandemic occurs, what how can your building react on those unforeseeable circumstances? And um, and if everybody thinks more about that and not trying to create their their masterpiece that will be there for three four hundred years. Um, then you will automatically uh, produce buildings that will be liked more, will be loved more, will be cared for more, and thus become more sustainable and more circular. I think that's one of the, the basic principles that architects uh, should work on. Thank you, Mano. Amy, can I go to you? Um, I don't know if I have anything nearly as eloquent as what Mano just said. I, I totally agree. I think what he's said is it's exactly spot on. We should be a little bit less precious and and think about the holistic um, impact of what we're doing. And and then the other answer that I've given to every question is education. I mean, I think that's how we're going to save the planet. We're going to have to learn to do it better. That, that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, no, nope, it's a fair point indeed. Um, and it's good about education. Sarah, over to you. Um, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to say two things. Oh, <laughs> I think. No, it's <laughs> I only <lied> one. <laughs> going back to post occupancy evaluation, I think we need to stop focusing on the next project and the next project and the next project and actually learn from the work that we do in each project that we do and stick around a bit and see what works and what doesn't so that we don't keep repeating the same mistakes. And also, I think we need to uh, going leading on from what Mano was saying is to stop thinking about ourselves as uh, people who just build new buildings that we have to look at our existing stock and see what we can do there and in the practice of architecture as not necessarily always being about building something new it's actually about problem solving so when you go into an organization who says you know we actually need a, a you know a, an extension to our operation maybe it's about looking at the operation and seeing if there's a way you can organize it better with the space that you have so i think it's expanding the scope of what an architect is uh, that it's not someone who builds things necessarily all the time maybe in 50 years we won't be building anything i don't know <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you for that sarah uh marco Oh, I agree with all contribution of the colleagues and I think the, the role of architects is important and through sketches and project, projects, we can contribute to better projects. projects. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we must understand that we are at the end of the line of environmental decisions, which are currently handled by politicians. We need uh, to resist, uh, take political positions and be more heard. I think this. Thank you. Thank you for that, Marco. And Julie, last but not least on this. Yeah, I'm going to plus one to all of the above. I, I think, you know, mine is probably a, a social bent on everything that was said or an interpersonal dynamic, which is just that we have to ask the critical questions and we can't be afraid or intimidated by experimentation and lessons learned along the way. You know, we're all figuring this out as we go. And if it was easy, we would have done it already. And, and as I've shared, this is and we, all of us have shared, this is a critically urgent issue. You know, our social contract and civilization is on the line. The comforts that we take for granted are at stake. Uh, and so through asking these questions and really listening and asking more questions instead of thinking about how do I respond and defend and reinforce the status quo, um, we can learn more about where the most effective opportunities lie for that particular instance and just not being afraid to try something and learn from it and then iterate it on the next project. You know, we're not going to solve world hunger on one project. It's kind of a it's a lifetime of work. <laughs> Yeah, it most certainly is. Uh, and this actually segue nicely. And Amy, if I could hold you there to the next question. And it's an extension of the first question I ask, where I ask what can uh, Architecture Institute do? And what the next question is um, from Anonymous here saying, hello architects. Uh, hello, architects have so much to offer in terms of creative design solutions, which we know to the climate emergency. Um, but really we can't make politics and policy changes, which is true. So I suppose the question here is about various institutes, but I also wonder whether we can expand it. What do you think as individual architects we can do to influence 
governments or you know how do we come together even more to be more powerful uh to be able to really make that policy shift in in in, in our you know pursuit of making sure that the climate emergency is addressed appropriately we'll start with you julie find my mute button there um you know all of the elected leaders that we've met with love examples. They love to see the success stories and the proof that we can do this, that we can create architecture uh, and cities that perform beautifully. Uh, so we introduce them to Code Top 10 award-winning projects in their local, in, in their local jurisdictions. Uh, we can also introduce them to our tools. So for example, in Madison, the capital city of the state of Wisconsin, uh, a code member introduced local administrators to the framework for design excellence, and it is now a part of their local building code. Uh, so there are ways that we can translate some of this uh, and use our influence and power of advocacy to, to help shape policy. But it, it starts with getting involved and building those relationships. Now oh, that's a really great example there, Julie. I'm gonna uh, start with the ladies before. Uh, so we're gonna move to Sarah, please. Yeah, I would actually echo that. I think as well, the institutes are really well placed to be a good um, meeting point for lots of different types of organisations, be that government policy. And also, I think we also need to remember about the other professional institutes and reach out there in terms of interdisciplinary. I was involved in a recent conference in Ireland that had surveyors and engineers and QSs at it. And it was uh, amazing that everyone is all all the construction professionals are having these same conversations at the same time and we need to i think get out of our silos and uh, work together that would be my answer thank you sarah amy um yeah i can't do much more than underline what julie and sarah have said i mean i think i 100 i think we have to advocate and julie could give us a master class in advocating and i think what sarah has said about you know, working together, it, it, that's how we're going to do it. Um, I don't I, I don't really have anything else valuable to add beyond those those two points. I think the 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 um, policies have to change because they help us to help us make the steps to encourage the clients um, yeah. because they have to do it. And, and it's really important that we have to do it right now. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and Marco and Manuel, have you got anything more that you want to add to that? Shall we start with you, Marco? Uh, I think Brazilian modern architecture experience presents many solutions that value uh, local, local materials, the local economy and the place as a way to stimulate, stimulate the tradition of the place and the economy. New generations have seen this and can contribute to the environment. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Manu, is there anything else you think that we can all do to influence politics and policies? Um, you know, vote for the right party. That's the way it starts. <laughs> we can try. <laughs> and, uh, well, <laughs> well, what we what we do is, well, one of the previous speakers said it already, start locally. You can, uh, locally is a lot possible. You can show with the local governments uh, have a nice projects, nice examples, and uh, they will, uh, yeah, they will eventually uh, uh, start uh, start the whole process, uh, start it up. So um, begin locally and, uh, and just uh, do it. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, it's, it is a duty of the institute to really speak on behalf of members as well, which I'm sure all institutes are. But I know all institutes are participating are doing just that. Um, and I'm, uh, Menno, the next question is, I'm going to start with you, actually. It's from Damien March. Uh, could all buildings become modular and interchangeable components? Um. In, in theory, that, that might be possible, but uh, as you see that over the last few hundred years, there are a lot of attempts made to to uh, have the uh, ideal uh, uh, compatible measurement system and none of it uh, um, uh, was successful. So I'm, we, we don't believe in making uh, buildings that are where, where everything's interchangeable. Uh, very successful, uh, high, high uh, um, high-valued products, uh, you see the same. Nobody tries to 
put a, a, a door of a Volkswagen into a Mercedes. Uh, that's that's just yeah. Why should all the car doors be compatible? Even within one brand, they're not compatible between the different models. So it's it's more like uh, if we start by by uh, making the the building, developing or designing our buildings which have more intrinsic value, as we call it, so they're, that they have value without um, uh, without uh, even people being in it, by, because you know what kind of materials it's made of. Uh, and, and that's more the modularity that, that we're looking for, like the, the, the modularity within one building, being able to to attach something to a building, to uh, to maybe split one building into two buildings, uh, or, uh, um, or put some some extra floors on it. That's the kind of modularity that uh, uh, it's more like flexibility, that is more uh, successful, uh, and, and not try to to invent the, the the column for every building. That's not uh, that's not a very smart thing to do, I think. No, no, that's uh, a really good point. Any other uh, other speakers? Uh, any of you want to add to that at all? I'm particularly silence as a no, but if you want to add something, please speak up. Uh, I can just add a little that I, I agree with Menno. I don't think anything is all in universal, um, but at, at a at the right scale, I think there are lots of efficiencies. So the the AMPS project, the active modular fighter remediation system that I shared in the PSAC um, is a modular system because a lot of people are doing green walls, uh, but when they're fully integrated and you know one custom system, they cost more. Uh, if one part fails, you have to bring in the specialist to you know fix it. And uh, in modular systems, if they're designed correctly, you can just pop out a cassette and put in another one. If the plant dies, if the irrigation fails, if the lighting you know, um, circuit got broken in that one particular piece, or you just wanted to change the plants and you know, with the season and change up the decor. Uh, so I think that there is the right situation and solution for some of those things, but it's definitely not a universal solution that can solve all of our challenges. Thank you. Thank you for that, Julie. Um, any other speakers that want to say anything else? OK, uh, I'm cautious of time, so I'm going to ask our last question and this is going to be addressed to all speakers and Julie, as we have you there, so we're going to start with you, if you don't mind. Um, this is from Rand Boydell uh, and his question is various design for strategies are now often used to apply circular economy principle to construction, for example, design for adaptability, design for deconstruction, design for longevity and etc etc these make us think differently about what we're designing for well beyond the immediate building process do you agree that these are valid and how can we mainstream them yeah right on i mean i think you, the question put it really well you know we have to look beyond the tip of our nose and the immediate short-term solution that our clients might be asking us to solve and you know, be good stewards of our clients' resources and reputation. You know, help them think about uh, what the future may entail, what their future risk might be, what their future costs might be. Uh, in in one of our healthcare client projects, uh, we recently completed an interior standards and furniture standards document with them, where we went through all the details of you know how should you select materials that are healthier for your people. Um, you know, that um, have, even if the initial cost is more, the maintenance over the lifetime of the material, not only the labor, but also the, the, the uh, cost of the raw materials to maintain it, you know, it may have a, a smaller upfront cost, but over the lifetime that we hope that this will, you know, be in place, it, it's much less. And so the challenge for us, though, is that oftentimes the way our clients are structured, the construction capital budget the operations budget uh, and you know the the future risk mitigation budget are three different pools of money and so again that facilitating conversations and alignment across uh, the client's team will help us come up with these more comprehensive and holistic solutions thank you julie uh, and i'm going to ask sarah uh, to come in Again, I like the way the question is framed in terms of these make us think differently, because I think that's exactly what we need to do. And if you're applying 
this kind of framework you're basically taking your design and you're applying a different lens to it and saying okay if we look at it in terms of design for deconstruction what does that do to our design it's stuff we do anyway we do it all, we've been doing it all the time but now we need to broaden our spectrum of lenses that we're applying and actually probably switch out the things that we think are core um, and the priority issues for issues like this and make them core and priority uh, and I think as well using I, I'm not really a fan always of frameworks and checklists but using something that helps to, to guide your design you so just like remind yourself have I looked at this have I considered this and um, what impact does that have on my design so I think the, the more we can stretch that uh, and, th and apply that different thinking the better Thank you, uh, Sarah. Amy. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 the right. It's a good question. Um, I think it it goes partially into the legislation. It goes partially into a number of you know not avoiding checklists, but sometimes it's good to have some things on on the checklist that we have to do. And if we have to do it properly, then it becomes more of than a tick box exercise. And I know that with planning in in the city of London you do now have to do this properly and you do now have to issue documents and have long conversations about how you're addressing these issues and by doing that I think it gives more importance because then we actually have to do it properly and we actually have to consider what we're doing and rethink how we're designing as opposed to just producing a report and and issuing it out so I I think it's I think this is a really good way to be moving forward and to have to do have to at least address how we're thinking about these issues. Thank you for that, Amy. Marco. Yes, uh, that happened a lot in the Amazonia, that it's important to keep the rainforest and the local tradition uh, generates circular economy. The use of kobogo, straw, uh, other ways of wood uh, is a form of resistance to the local uh, people and the uh, architecture, and uh, I think it's to uh, circular economy. Thank you, Marco. Um, and last but certainly not least, Mano. Um, yeah, I would like to, to turn it around a bit because I think circular building has already been mainstream for a long time, but we drifted away from it. There are a lot of lot of buildings that are uh, in, built in the past that are used over and over again. The only thing that most of the buildings we made ourselves over the past uh, 60 or 80 years are not uh, not that circular again, uh, or circular anymore. So look at the old warehouses that change from uh, from a function uh, uh, here in, in Holland. You have the canal houses that can be a warehouse, can be uh, an office space, can be a student uh, house, can be uh, a family house over the over the, the two, three, four hundred years. So that's also a way of, of, of you know, circular building that we drifted away from by making a very specific office building, a very, a very specific housing project, uh, by making a very two specific buildings that cannot be they cannot be changing in, in functions again. Um, so that's something that I think we should uh, yeah we should should get back to. And uh, in that, uh, a good example I find in the, the, the book of uh, Stuart Brandt, I also quoted him in my presentation, uh, his book, uh, uh, how, uh, uh, how Buildings uh, Get Old or How Buildings Learn, I think it's the title. Uh, and there he, he also uh, warns for the premature complexity that a lot of buildings suffer from, like the complexity that, that should grow into a building over 50, 100, 200 years is much too often already introduced in the first years by, by a very ambitious architect. And then you see that the, by that premature complexity, the, uh, the building is unable to, uh, to grow old, to absorb different kind of, uh, of uh, social, uh, social uh, changes. And, uh, and that's something that I think we should should go back to. It's not something new, building circular buildings. The circular economy is definitely not new. Way before people were on the planet, it was already circular. Um, but we should go back to that and we should really look at the circular principles and apply them to, to everything you do, uh, not only architecture. 
Thank you. I know that's eloquently put and actually uh, that uh, uh, nicely close uh, this session. We have other questions. I'm sorry we can't get to all the questions, but we will come back to you audience um, with answers where we can. Um, I am really thankful to all the speakers. It's been a, truly a pleasure to be chairing to this inspiring session. I've learned so much uh, and I'm not an architect. There's been some very interesting projects, ideas and books for me to explore as well. Thank you again to all our speakers for today's event, Julie Hiromoto of HKS Architects USA, Marco Serreto, Professor at the Technology School of Universidade Federal de Amazonas, Brazil, Sarah O'Dwyer, Chair of the RIAI Sustainability Task Force Ireland, Amy Holtz, PLP Architecture UK, Mena Rubens, CPZ Projects, Netherlands. I would also like to thank our sister institute, the American Institute of Architects, the Australian Institute of Architects, the Architecture Society of China, the Royal Institute of Dutch Architects, the Council of Architecture and Urbanism in Brazil, the Japan Institute of Architects, the Korean Institute of Architects, the New Zealand Institute of Architects and the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland for their support and contribution. It has been a true pleasure to be working and collaborating with all these institutes. Without their support, we won't be here today. So huge thanks to everyone. That's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining and contributing with such interesting questions. I hope you've enjoyed the session as much as I have. Please do follow us at Riba Global to keep abreast of upcoming international activities, which we often work with our sister institutes. For now, again, a huge thanks to our speakers and to today's worldwide audience for watching. I wish you all a very good day and evening wherever you are in the world. Until next time, take care and stay safe. <laughs>